Good morning, Jamie. Good morning, thank Shai. For, uh, thank you for being with us today. We're very excited uh, to speak with you and learn about your journey. Um, it's, it's been a long time that we wanted to do this. Um, so where do we even start? I, I, I really want to provide people with some of uh, you know, the, the, the incredible journey that you've had. And I, I'd love to start there. This is something that you can, uh, I know it's a long journey. <laughs> Uh, and there was a lot there, but how would you, you know, could you share the journey that got you to this point in time today, you know? Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, there is a lot, but um, if I think about my love affair with Parks and Recreation, um, it really started, sounds a bit cliche, but, you know, as a kid, which I think is the case with most of us who gravitated to this profession. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in, in particular, um, sports leagues in my hometown. And unbeknownst to me, obviously I was being influenced significantly by parks and recreation, you know, as, as early as six, seven years of age. I participated in youth softball leagues. Uh, my mom was a huge advocate. She actually participated in the adult leagues in our community. Oh. And, um, you know, I was a single, my mom was a single mom as an only child. And so we really bonded over those experiences. Uh, I had the opportunity to continue to play, you know, in a recreational setting over time in a more competitive setting. My lifelong friends were created in those moments. And, you know, essentially, again, that's where my love affair began with Parks and Recreation, unbeknownst to me. I had no idea that I would one day be the person facilitating those kinds of activities and fostering those kinds of activities. So it started in that moment in time and it continued to grow. You know, I led the Pepsi Hotshot programs and did special events as a teenager. The Pepsi? Pepsi Hotshot. Yeah, it was a, a shooting contest for kids, oh, basketball wow. shooting contest. Did that in my teenage years. I officiated baseball and softball and, and basketball. Uh, games. I, I didn't know about the basketball parts. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was when I was the same height as everyone else. And then that quickly came to an abrupt halt and everyone else started to sprout up and I remained the shortest person in the room. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I started to then work in the field and I didn't understand what I was frankly doing in that moment in time in terms of influencing other people and and becoming a, you know, I think a better human being, frankly. And that was where you know, the notion of service began in my life. And so I, you know, I continued to play ball and engage and, and work in these kind of environments and ultimately, you know, graduated college and I started coaching in an entirely different way. And ultimately, uh, Parks and Recreation became a discovery career for me. Uh, you know, I had no intention of being in Parks and Recreation. I was a college softball coach. Um, and I had the opportunity to become a sports coordinator for the Champaign Park District in Illinois, which is my home state. The Champaign Park District. Champaign Park District. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I started to really find my way in that moment in time. I had a chance to better understand the influence, the purpose of the profession, you know, influencing people's lives, our quality of life in communities, the social fabric in our communities, and really began to embrace that and understand it differently. Um, had the chance to work in different muni municipalities in my career. Um, I had the chance to teach in higher education in parks and recreation. And, you know, today I find myself obviously in a consulting and, and advocate role. So I, I will say at times, you know, how privileged am I to be able to have been a professional, you know, practitioner, uh, an educator, and a consultant in this, this world that I love. I've had the privilege of serving over my adult career. Um, I've been fortunate to love what I do. Not many people can say that. Uh, so it, it's been really the profession and the, the notion and the nobility of Parks and Recreation has really been a gift in my life. I love it. Um, before I move to the next question, I, I, something just, just came up when you said uh, teaching Parks and Rec. A lot of people don't know about this, including myself, when you, know, when you mentioned that to me. Can you, can you touch on that real brief? Sure. Yeah. So teaching is part of being a professional? Yeah, like because I, I know there is, you mentioned there are programs that, you know, people go in and learn this incredible profession and they, they get to do eventually what you've been doing. And, and so how, how do you, you know, how does that work? Like what, what can you share about teaching that profession? So, 
you know, it's funny, I think back to my college days, I was not a park and rec major. And many people are a bit surprised by that, who I cross paths with. Um, my two best friends in college were leisure studies majors, which was parks and recreation. It's just another title. And I made fun of them. I'm like, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? You're gonna pick up trash you made fun of them. all the time, all the time. Um, and then ultimately, you know, they got the upper hand because now they, they often bring up those stories, those sad stories of me kind of poking fun of them. Um, I didn't really understand the field until I got in it. And when I was the director of recreation and community services in Bloomington, Indiana, is when I really got the chance to get my feet wet in higher education. Um, started guest lecturing, you know, teaching a class here and there. Um, ultimately had the chance to teach for two years at Illinois State in park and rec administration. Illinois State. Mm -hmm, and public administration. And I did not become a student of the field until I started teaching. And so I had to really study and research and understand the foundations of parks and recreation and leisure and what that meant and how it connected to our daily lives and how it influenced who we are and what we do. And so I had a bit of a, again, I use the phrase love affair uh, with the profession, but through a different lens, right? right? Now as an educator, because I better understood it. And so uh, it was my introduction to what I referred to as the ivory tower, right? Higher education. Um, I didn't pursue a PhD, but I still remained interested and connected with education. It, it's laced in what I do today. I have the chance today to teach at Indiana University in the master's program in financial management. Um, so it was just a, another opportunity that I, I think I was, at the time didn't realize I was wise enough to grab hold of and run with, so. And I love that you mentioned you learn more as a teacher. That is, that's so powerful. So were, were those, well, I mean, not, not, not were those, were, what were, um, you know, the tipping points, what you consider a life tipping point for you in this journey coming from, you know, softball coach, you know, being a referee for, for, for Bebo when you're at the right height, starting to teach, learning more about it, like, what were some of the tipping points? You're like, oh my God. There were a few, um, probably more than a few, but um, those that kind of percolate to the top of my food chain um, in terms of tipping point moments in my life. Uh, one would be, you know, taking the job at the Champaign Park District. It was many years ago, um, but I was a college softball coach. I never imagined at any moment I would find myself as a park and recreation professional. Um, it was an opportunity. And frankly, I couldn't, I couldn't make a living being a, a woman softball coach in that moment. You could not make a living that, you couldn't sustain life with the salaries that were being paid. So I had to find some other alternative. And I, I saw a sports coordinator job at the Champaign Park District. I'm like, I'm a sporty, I get this, I can do this. I can program youth soccer leagues and all this. this is, I got this, this is cake. Uh, and so you got in through the sports I coordinator. got in through the sports role, yeah. right? And okay. so it was my, introduction to parks and recreation as a profession, truly a vocation, um, as opposed to just a hobby, right? Something I love to do. And so that was a huge tipping point for me. It, and oftentimes, you know, you'll hear about students in higher ed having a discovery major. For me, it was a discovery profession, right? I, I, oh. I've, I've, I was introduced to it in that moment in time. And it was, so it was a, clearly a huge uh, tipping point in my life. Um, later, um, you know, I worked for the city of Boulder. I had some interesting uh, political challenges. Um, they were, and this is, sorry, this is after Champlain. Oh, this was many years later. Many years later. Yeah, okay. this would have been, you know, 2008. Okay, and that was another tipping point. Huge tipping point. Okay. Because it provided me um, a clearer view of reality, I think. Um, At Boulder? Well, just in general. General? Um, I was tested, I, my character was tested, my ethics were tested in that moment. And so I made a conscious decision to leave local government and pursue something else. And it was really where the idea of starting 110% uh, was birthed. I, I left the city of Boulder under some really challenging conditions and circumstances, but I, I felt like from a values perspective, that's what I needed to do in that moment in time. And, and I look back today and I'm, thrilled with the choice that I made to leave yeah. that in, that organization and being a local government employee to pursue other opportunities, yeah. such as consulting. 
Um, and then the last one would have been, frankly, a year after I started 110%, my mom passed away. Um, she had been sick. I lost all three. I had three parents, um, a stepdad, my mom, and my father all died the year I started 110%. And it was, it tested just me as a person, um, my perseverance, um, my attitude, you know, what did I want to do with the rest of my life? It was a reminder of mortality. You know, all those things happened in that very brief moment in time. And I had started a consulting firm for local government on the coattails of the recession. I often ask myself, are you incredibly naive or just plain stupid? You know, is this the right thing to do in this moment in time? So, so it was a personal test. Job, prior to the right after the recession, you decide to start your own thing. You lose three members of your family that are so close to you, three parents. Yep. How, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. How do you stay, so, so, so how do you stay focused? How do you stay on mission? How do you, how do you find the strength to? Well, largely because of the people that I lost that year. Um, I could talk all day long about my mom. But that was a big part of it. She was my motivation. You know, she was an incredible role model. There were so many journeys that she took throughout her life that were incredibly inspirational. So I relied a lot on that to get me through. And you know, we all deal with challenges and you know, we all have a story. It's just a part of my story, but it allowed me to stay the course. And um, you know, I was incredibly fortunate to be able to do that for whatever reason, whatever I whatever I pulled out of the, you know, the bag that helped me get up the next morning and try to maintain a positive attitude and keep moving forward. Um, I did. And yeah. it's it's worked out. Yeah. I'm 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 happy to hear that it did. Yeah. Um so if I'm understanding correctly, the, the really the moment that sparked the idea, the moment or the, or the period of time for you to start 110% was that, you know, being a local government and, and learning that, you know, you're not aligned with some of these things. We don't need to get into them. Um, the way certain things were, were being done, you said, well, I can probably have a much bigger impact, which you do, uh, could probably have a much bigger impact on the profession and, 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 and serve them better. I don't use that word a lot, and I love it. Um, if I start my own thing and I can help many, many agencies rather than work in one. Absolutely, that absolutely. And it was interesting because in that moment or within that window of time when I made that conscious decision to leave, I reflected back on something I said over and over and over again. I actually was privileged to be an intern supervisor. I supervised 31 interns within my 20 year career, practitioner career. And I said to every one of them, you can be committed to your position or you can be, can be committed to your profession. And that message came back to me, like I have an opportunity to exemplify, maybe enhance, strengthen my commitment to the profession by excusing myself from one organization and trying to do something good, whatever that ended up being for the profession. You know, the colleagues I had across the country, you know, it was what can I do to help? Yeah. Just in a different way, in a broader way, a broader stroke way. And in a more profound, from my perspective, in a more profound way. And it's not to suggest that those who work in organizations today don't do that every single day, because they do. They do their best to do right by their communities. I just felt like I had a chance to you know, have a broader reach. Yeah. And so that's that's what really um, inspired me and motivated me to take the leap. Yeah. That actually uh, uh, connects the dots for me because we spoke about purpose often. Um, but what you just said about, you know, you're, you're mentoring all these people and you're telling them you can, be, you can be dedicated to your position or you can be dedicated to the profession and, and that's what a purpose is. And, I guess finding that made a big change for you. So was, let's talk about that love affair with Parks and Recreation. <clears throat> Actually, if you don't mind, what would you say was the difference between, this is not here, but what would you say the difference between Champlain and Boulder? Cause, cause one of them didn't have that kind of like, ooh, I'm not, I'm not really aligned with this. Cause clearly you were there for many years and, and you fell in love there with the profession. And, and then the other one was more like, you know, I love the profession, but I'm not sure that I like what's going on here. So what, what was, we don't need to get into details, but I'm, I'm super curious. It's, and believe it or not, that's it's a simple thing for me to answer. So I worked in three organizations 
as a practitioner, yeah. professional. I was in Champaign, Illinois, Champaign Park District. I was a sports coordinator. I became a facility manager, and then I became the acting director of recreation. I moved from there to the city of Bloomington, Indiana, where I became the director of recreation and community services. And then I found myself in Boulder, Colorado as a superintendent. In Champaign, I started my career boots on the ground. I interacted with moms and dads and kids every day. I had an office in a rec center. You could hear the kids screaming in the gym. You move into a more administrative capacity, you become less connected with the community. You become more connected with policy and politics and process. And so there was a, there's a gravitation, it's inherent, right? You go from frontline, boots on the ground, immersed in the community, to less immersion in the community and more in, immersed in process and politics. Yeah. And so it makes all the difference in the world in terms of the experience that you have um, and what that means to you. Mm. And so I, I really valued and appreciated every experience I had, regardless of the organization I was in. There were things I took away that accentuated, affirmed things to do. There were also things in every organization I took away as lessons in I will never do that again, <laughs> or, or you know, maybe I'll think about it differently, or whatever it may be. And I think that's the case for all of us, no matter where we work. But that that shift from immediate direct community contact to less community contact and more immersion in policy, politics, um, it makes a difference in how you, for me, how you think about your work. I see that. How would you explain your, your love affair with parks and recreation? We touched on it, but um, so specifically, why did you become interested in, in, the, in the financial sustainability of the profession? I don't want to guess that it's from, as you saw things uh, happening on the administrative level that probably sparked it, but I, I would love to hear more like what, what brought you to say, hey, this is, this is really needed. Why were you interested in it? Yeah. It started when I was 25 years old and I was a sports coordinator in Champaign and I remember asking about the budget with our comptroller. And he basically excused me and simply said, just tell me what you need, don't worry about it. We have plenty of money in the bank. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what the message was. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit um, shocked <laughs> by that reaction. And so, so I started to, to, to pay a little bit more attention to that stuff, even in my early days. Of course, as I got into administrative roles, it was my responsibility. I made a commitment to make sure every single employee in the system, regardless of what seat in the stands they had, what level in the organization they were in, they had some understanding of the budget process, where our money came from, how we were spending our money, right? And so over time, I just felt um, that it was critically important to the survival of the organization and to the responsibility I had to the taxpayers to make sure that that was as much um, top of mind as anything we were doing. Regar you know, yes, what kind of services we were providing or what facility we were gonna build next or community engagement or whatever it was, was important. But this to me was a topic of critical importance because it was the way we were going to, forgive the word, sustain our system, right? It was about legacy. It wasn't about, it wasn't about just today's citizens. It was about the citizens of, if I would say today, it's about the citizens of 2022 and it's about the citizens of 2050 that aren't even here yet, right? So it just, it was an evolution. And yes, as I became more experienced, as I transitioned through the profession, I moved into administrative roles, it just affirmed the importance of that for me and it accentuated the importance of that for me um, for the entire profession. Alternatively, we're government. We forget we're privileged to be the the stewards of other people's money. Yeah. Every day we spent, I got to spend other people's money. I was writing checks on the backs of every taxpayer in that community and they didn't know how I was spending their money. So to me, it just, it spoke to character and ethics and responsibility and it sounds kind of cliche and maybe a little Pollyanna, but that's how I felt about it. And so there was this gravitational pull for me to go, okay, I think this is one of the most, if not the most important thing we could be doing right now is spending our time and our energy on this discussion, on this content, and on creating responsible strategy about how we're gonna invest these dollars. So, so I mean, I've, I've, I've been to, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of 
you know, attending some of your talks and, and learning more about it. And that's a, it really for, for me was an eye opener. I, I didn't realize that's how things work and I'm sure that uh, uh, many can benefit. And how, what would you say are like one or two examples where you've really seen like how it, it, it changed, it had such a massive impact, the work that you did with, with an agency on how they do things or the level of awareness or whatever it is, what, what were some of the impacts that, that you've seen in them becoming more financially sustainable? There are, we have, we call them case studies, right? You know, this organization did this with the results of our work or this organization did this. But I will tell you from my perspective, the greatest impact is to hear, let's say a, a parks maintenance employee use terms like financial sustainability or responsibility or we're spending taxpayer money. All of our work is grounded in education. We start every project with broad stroke education. We want every full-time employee, maybe even some of the part-time employees in the system, boards, councils, commissions, we, we encourage the executive directors, those who are, if you will, in charge making the decisions to engage those people in the conversation. Let's have a little face time and talk about why this is so important to our profession. Why is it so important to your organization? Why is it so important to you? And when I hear a professional or a board member say something like, we need to be responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars, or why are we making that investment decision? That makes me really happy. I mean, that puts a smile on my face, and I know it probably sounds funny. That's a success story to me. Yes, there are the, we saved $150,000 by doing X. We combined these services because we weren't providing those services at capacity and we weren't being efficient with taxpayer dollars. Yes, there's a lot of those stories. You know, Napa, California, Louisville, Texas, Brookline, Massachusetts, Austin, Texas, um, Oregon City, Oregon, Parker, Colorado. I mean, there is a list. Yeah. But to me, it's, it's the word choice, the meaning, and how that translates to actionable results that makes all the difference in the world. And it, it, especially somebody from the park side who tend to excuse themselves from this conversation, well, that only has to do with recreation. It doesn't have to do with us. It has everything to do with them. And the ones that are less interested in this, finding them more interested in it, um, that gets me really excited. And I think that's a success story. Yeah. And we need more of that. We need just people to understand. Or the young sports coordinator at Champaign. Or the young that, sports coordinator. That gets told that, yep. yeah, oh, don't worry about it. We have tons of uh -huh. money. Yeah. I love it. So what is, uh, in, in, in your own words, and I'm, I mean, obviously they're your own words, but how would you, for, for us folks that don't know much about it, how would you describe what financial sustainability is and why it's important? I think we touched on why it's important, but what is it? In a nutshell, how do we, you know, if I said, explain it to me like I'm five. Yeah. Having the money to do what's critically important in your community for the long haul. Um, that doesn't mean expecting that taxpayer dollars are just going to keep coming. It doesn't mean that taxpayers are going to want to give you more. I like to think about it in a, a couple of very simple ways. Um, doing better with what you have rather than expecting to get more of what may not exist. Doing better with what you have, being more responsible, being thoughtful about the investment choices you make. And understanding, particularly as a profession that is a social service profession, you know, I think the vast majority of us that gravitated towards this field, I want to say exclusively every one of us, we have big social service hearts. What can I do for you? How can I make your life better? But we got to understand in order to be able to do that, we got to be able to pay the bills. We got to be able to write the checks. And so when we're not thoughtful, we're not responsible, we don't, you know, we really don't process why are we spending this money? Is it logical? Is it responsible? Is this what we should be doing? We don't think about those choices and we do them reactively, irrationally sometimes. We are wasting the resources we have rather than where should we be putting them in this moment in time to have the greatest impacts on our community and ensure that we can keep the train moving, right? Ensure that we are still standing strong, again, for the citizens of 2050, not just in this moment in time. So. It's not really rocket science in a lot of ways, but it can yeah. be intimidating to a social service profession where we don't want to necessarily or like to talk about 
the money and the, you know the da the data, the numbers. But we can begin to embrace it. You know, data is your friend. Yeah. It's not your enemy, yeah. and it's going to help you do what you really think is important today and tomorrow and so on. So to piggyback on that, um, that is your friend. It's definitely hard for some people to become friendly with data. I personally know a few. Uh, but what, what advice would you give someone that I guess is hesitant to, to begin the journey um, to becoming financially sustainable? And in addition to that, how much of it would you say is education versus intervention? Or maybe they do know, but they're just like, they know enough that it scares them. So what part is purely educational, how much is it? And maybe it's a combination of both, but. Yeah, I absolutely think it's a combination of both. And at the same time, honestly, I think if somebody put some energy and effort into educating themselves, understanding, informing, they could do it. They don't necessarily need the intervention, but those that may not, I don't want to say have the will, because I, I hope that everybody does have the will. They understand the importance of this. That's not always the case. I think that intervention becomes critical because you want to sometimes feel like you're part of a community. You want to hold hands with someone. You want to make it less intimidating. Um, you know, I think that's what we try to do is, is say, okay, I understand you want to do this work, but you're not necessarily prepared to do it alone. You want, again, you want somebody to hold your hand, you know, and help you along the way. And so I, I think it depends on the person, right? It depends on the organization, their reality in that moment in time. Some may have the propensity, the competency to do it by themselves, right? Just learn a little bit, embrace it, go for it. Others may say, we want to get there, but right now we're not prepared to do it by ourselves. And we do need a little bit of, again, maybe hand-holding, encouragement. Yeah. Right? Um, we talk about, you know, data is your friend, and there's, there's, I mean, there's an innate human nature to be resistant or afraid of change, um, although we know it's necessary. How, what advice would you give on how to overcome this fear of data and this fear of, you know, using technology? Because even after the education part is done and they've learned so much and you believe that they are ready to, to do the maintenance, I guess, that the, the groundwork has been done and, and, and uh, the education and their they're ready for it, there's still some resistance to, okay, how do we do this moving forward? How do we leverage technology? How do we use data? Like, what are, what is some of the advice that you would, you would give? And maybe we can tell the people on the camera, like, this is, you know, once you're ready for that and you've learned, this is my best advice on how you need to continue and maintain that. Yeah. As a field, the professionals in the field, again, social servants, we don't see data as our friend. We see it almost as a nemesis because I think far as a too nemesis. yes, far too often we see it's going to lead us down a path of um, loss. If we reveal X, it's going to mean this negative thing. I'm going to lose a program. I'm going to lose a service. I'm going to upset the community. Oh. Alternatively, if we started to think about it through a more rose-colored lens, right? through rose-colored glasses of, this is gonna help us immensely by sharing X, Y, and Z, right? It's gonna reveal where we have opportunities. Where we re reveal we have opportunities to serve that community where we've never been able to serve to the degree we've wanted to before, or we've needed to before. It's gonna reveal opportunities for us to take care of that irrigation system in that park that we've been deferring the maintenance of for the last 10 years. We don't look at it always through an opportunistic lens. We look at it through a lens of loss mm. and anxiety. And we react based upon that without really understanding that none of those th things may ever come to fruition. They may ever be realized. We, so I would love if we could <laughs> experience our own professional tipping point of seeing it, again, through the rose-colored glasses perspective rather than the perspective of this is really not going to be fruitful for us. It's going to be problematic. It's going to be bad. No, it presents incredible opportunities. And the organizations that are doing this work are seeing that. It's coming to life. Those reveals are happening. They're opening the curtain. And rather than it being dark, it's like, you know, they're seeing light. Mm 
Yeah. And so um, I would hope <laughs> uh, that that happens sooner than later. And I think we're going to see more of that, the more organizations that dip their toe in the water and go, it's actually warmer than we thought. Uh, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It. So I love it. So what's the, uh, what would you like the uh, Jamie Sabat legacy <laughs> to be? I love that word. There's the big, hairy, audacious yeah. question. Um, I think our profession embracing, embracing the idea, the nobility, the purpose, the why of financial sustainability rather than running from it or fearing it, embracing it. And, and what I would love to see, legacy or not, is that become a mandate in every system across the United States. This is, this is more important than master planning, right? We all want to do a master plan. We want to build things. We want to grow. This becomes foundational to constructing the house, right? This is the foundation for everything that we do. If, I'll say maybe when that happens, um, I will die a happy person. <laughs> um, Jamie, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, you said, you know, you have the privilege of serving Parks and Rec field. I think um, Parks and Rec professionals are, are blessed to have someone like you um, share this experience and, and be so dedicated to what you're doing. Um, your journey is incredible. Thank you for sharing all that today. And I can't wait to see um, the, the additional impacts and more, you know, the ripple effects that everything you're doing has on the field itself. For somebody that's new, I'm learning a lot from you. Thank you. Thanks, Shai.